Well, it has been a long time. Some of that on purpose. I thought I'll lay this down. But um, our normal Christian life is a life, as I said once, uh, we sing continually according to the Bible. Let us offer to God the sacrifices of praise without ceasing. We pray without ceasing and day and night we meditate on God's word. So the normal Christian life is a very intense life, but it's not stressed out intensity. It's, uh, as the title says, the pursuit of God, the pursuit of God. Why do we pursue him? It's definitely a biblical theme, waiting on the Lord. Mary who chose to sit and listen to the heart of God through Jesus. <laughs> it's a biblical theme, the pursuit of God. There are some trends that are growing and increasing according to the Bible as well as obviously in our sight. There are trends that are uh, marking this earth. Jesus said the last days uh, iniquity will abound. The love of many will grow cold. I like to work out that equation. How can iniquity increase? And it's, it's all these things. Uh, there is an equation. There's a thinking of through and how on earth did we come to a point where a lie is believed and and it's like somebody saying you are a human being created in the image and likeness of God there's such dignity and nobility in that and they said no I'm not a human being created by God they believe the lie and uh, it's very relevant in where we go. If I leap about through the notes, I'll miss the middle bit. So I'm going to labor through a little again. Beginning, Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus says the love for him, loving Jesus, will result in us holding his word in our hearts and keeping his word alive in our hearts, not letting, it, not letting his word be stolen from us and replaced with a lie. And Jesus said, that's what someone who loves me does. They keep my word retain my thinking in all the adversities and trends and lies that are prolific across this earth. But the lover of Jesus keeps, holds fast the word of God. And the Father and the Son will make their lives, our lives, their home. Can you hear that? God with me in this place, in reality, God is with me. My goodness, see how real that should become. That is the point of the pursuit of God. The difference is knowing his presence is with us. Some say, I accept it all by faith. And to that I say, no way. If God is in this place, I will know it and I will pursue his heart until I know he is here. We'll come to that lovely wording of Job. We'll come to that if we get to the end and don't skip. I will pursue him. He is here. I want to know about it. It's been said like God's presence is everywhere throughout the universe, heaven, hell, God is there. There isn't a place where God is not, but his manifest presence is only no, there where people know he is there. We'll come to that. Working with the Holy Spirit in our lives, our identity is spiritually known. 
our identity, who you are, is spiritually known. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. And that spirit he has sent into you cries out, Abba, Father, an acknowledgement of God is my father. By his spirit within me, I'm working with God. See, because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, not subject to God, and it de indeed it cannot be. The carnal mind, the natural mind cannot perceive this, cannot appreciate it, doesn't discern it. So if we're in our natural mind, we're dumb to the presence of God. You did not receive the spirit of bondage to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I'm not giving the references on this occasion for the sake of time. Uh, Ephesians, I'm not giving a reference. No longer walking in the futility of your mind, but being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind is renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind is a spiritual thing as well as a kind of mechanical machine intellectual mind, we be renewed in the spirit of your mind, the scripture says. So our identity, spiritually known, being renewed in the spirit of your mind, that hints at something we'll talk about. It's relational, it's the spirit of your mind, being renewed in the spirit of your mind demands that we have a relationship going on and that's how we're renewed. We'll come to that. Listen to these good truths of our identity and receive them. God chose me before the foundations of this world. We can all say that if we're in Christ. God chose me before the foundation of the world. And Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Whoa, I thought I made a choice for Christ. No. You were led to that point because Jesus chose to bring you to that point. Jesus chose you. God demonstrates his love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's when he chose you, when you were still in sin. Christ died for us then, not when you became a good person. <laughs> I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. Those who read the Bible, you'll know about the shield of faith which is part of the armor of God, quenching the fiery darts, the lies about our identity. The shield of faith quenches them. And there's some good talking out there by one friend I know, talking about the armor of God and dealing with the lies. What if they get past the shield of faith? That's another story. There is a method. The just shall live believing the whole truth of their identity and contending against lies that seek to intimidate and belittle our true identity. So there is an enemy, the devil is lying, sends forth all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, temptation that leads you astray, gets you off focusing on who you really are. You're now feeling like this, you're feeling like that. Are those feelings your identity? No. The enemy's trying to get you distracted. And that's an ongoing uh, life contending. That's why we need the armor of God. I am, I think I said it here, I am a child of God, but we'll come to that. What is your problem? 
I believe we need to acknowledge what was our problem if we are to identify our problems in the now. What, what is your problem? We were dead in our transgressions and sin, the Bible says. We were, we're not just slightly out of line, we were dead in our transgressions. That was our problem. Now, when we start to, uh, I, you know, take our identity from what God says about us, we can also apply what God says about our identity now. And we, we will talk about that. He made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's Ephesians 2, 1. But I'm not giving the references. Psalm 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. My point, he has said that in his heart. The fool has said there is no God in his heart. Not in his mind, not in his mouth, but in his heart he has said there is no God. Just a distinct point, because we want truth in our hearts, not in our mind, not just in our mouth. We want truth in our heart. And here's this relational aspect. True repentance, real faith. I said that on a few videos back. I was going to call my video that, True Repentance, Real Faith. We move from a lie about ourselves, not by stronger resolve, in other words, lip service, etc., etc., but by repentance and receiving God's word of truth about our identity. See, we are repentant because I allowed a lie to make void what God says about me. I repent of that. If I've allowed a lie to displace the truth of God about me, then I, I, you know, that's wrong. I repent of that. I'm sorry about letting a lie be louder in me than the truth that God says. And there's a benefit in that, and that's the point here, as well as the presence of God, the pursuit of God. So when I speak of being chosen, loved, while still in sin, I am believing the truth of what God says was my problem. But I go on from that. I am receiving the truth of my forgiveness. God says I am forgiven. I'm cleansed from all uh, uncleanness, unright, I'm cleansed, I'm washed. I'm justified, made as though I just as if I had never sinned, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. And I made the righteousness of God in Christ. I am a child of God. You see, there's about five great statements of who I am. They're cleansed, washed, forgiven, righteous, justified. I'm a child of God. That's the truth. Now, if I'm drawn aside by a lying devil to fail from my true identity and power in Christ, then I can tend to believe I am now a failure. And that's not the truth. I'm a child of God who slipped, failed, but I'm not a failure. And I repent of not just the sin, but allowing the lie. So I'm restored and repent and have true faith, real faith in who God says I am. Woe to the liar who challenges the truth of God with his accusations. An attitude must develop against that lying accusation. You must have an attitude and get sick of it one day. Disillusioned, one old, one young, young man, a preacher in London, said if you have been disillusioned, it was because you were believing an illusion. And uh, there's, there's a, something I, we might touch a bit on that. If we're disillusioned, we believe something false. And there, and there are many 
people who just want to say something good is going to happen. Now, something good is going to happen if you have a perspective of spiritual revelation. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. The circumstances weren't going to feel good, but he had a spiritual revelation of the whole picture and it was for the joy of seeing us come to Christ. It was the joy of pleasing the Father and re re-entering that place with the Father that he held from the beginning. For the joy of that, those things. You see, now we're going to have to have a joy that's located in true re revelation and not the circumstances. Now, many people have tried to say the circumstances are all going to be rosy. And I'll say you haven't read the Bible, boy. But I will say some strong things. And I'm using some other scriptures here to underline what Jesus said. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it nor withstand the onslaught of the increase of my government. I will rule in the midst of my enemies and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. This is a declaration from Jesus and it is a declaration using those other scriptures proclaimed over Jesus. And I forgot to print the other one I wanted to put here. I have set my king upon my holy mountain of Zion. I wanted to include that. Jesus, I will build my church. And all those other scriptures are decrees from the Father of what is already revealed to the Father. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Have they or haven't they? It is written, they have. <laughs> you see, there is a true revelation there about the church Jesus is building. Not I will make a rose bar garden and everything sweet but in the eyes of eternity, it's sweet and it's beautiful. Anyway, keep moving on. But notice that in the last times, perilous times will come. Speaking of the end times and our gathering together to Christ. Perilous times. Uh, for this reason, because they didn't retain God in their thinking, their, God will send a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So it's like, if you're gonna hand in hand walk in lies, God will make that the strong delusion that you believe until you are convinced your lie is the truth. Multitudes of people on this planet are believing a deluded lie regarding themselves, regarding life, regarding God, and they are suffering because of it. But they're convincing themselves in a mantra, no, my lie is the truth. You see how it's working out there. There's a scripture in Matthew 24 that talks about, uh, it's another little illusion that we have believed, and now we're disillusioned. Unless those days were shortened, a period of tribulation on the earth, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. My simple point, the elect are there in a period of great tribulation. How great that tribulation, will it get worse? And then this rapture that has been uh, out of proportion taught and out of place and out of time because the scripture plainly says that such tribulation that God has to shorten the days otherwise no flesh would be saved uh, you know live and for the elect's sake God is going to shorten those days not an illusion not disillusion because somebody has taught you some slight 
out of proportion error. All that to say, we are talking about truth, our identity, the pursuit of God. And this is a lovely point. And uh, surely the Lord is in this place, but I did not know it. We'll talk about that scripture because uh, I'm not giving references, but Genesis 28, Jacob dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above that ladder and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to your descendants. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. My point is we can pursue God to know he is in this place. It's a lovely story, that Genesis, because Jacob had placed a rock as a pillar. I hope he had a cloth over it, a bit softer. But after this dream, and it wasn't a dream, was it? It was a visitation from the living God. And God stood and spoke from the top of the ladder. But he said that this is none other than the, the house of God, the gate of heaven. And he poured an offering on that stone. And he said, surely this is the house of God. And that actual place was Bethel. And upon that place, upon that stone, the house of God was built. See how significant God is in his perchance meetings, dreams, visions, and visitations. Finally, coming into land, the Bible uses the phrase, the burden of the Lord in the Old Testament. It is relevant to our presence of God, pursuit of God, knowing he is here. Jesus making there and the Father being at our home, our lives, their home in reality. What about making that reality known to yourself, allowing, pursuing God? until you know God is with you. Anyway, that phrase, the burden of the Lord, it denoted the weightiness of the heart of God by the Holy Spirit resting upon the prophet of God or the servant, the spokesman of God. The burden of the Lord was a weighty thing by the Holy Spirit. They, they knew they had something to give away and and if it was resisted or rejected, they weren't resisting them, as Jesus said. If they receive me, they re- receive you, they receive me. They weren't resist, you know, they were resisting the Lord. The weightiness of that reality of the burden of the Lord is that's the lost language in people's thinking, as I bring out here a bit. In a similar way, God undeniably spoke using dreams. Often they were more than a dream, but rather a vision and visitation from the Lord. We've just seen that in Jacob. God used dreams and this burden of the Lord. We remember Joseph and his dreams, despised by his brothers. We have Jacob wrestling with an angel of the Lord and a dream vision that we've just spoken of where he'd seen angels ascending and descending. At one time, God challenges the people and says, you shall no longer use this phrase, the burden of the Lord. For many had spoken a vision of their own heart and prophesied out of their own spirit. Likewise, there was a God, a time when God char- challenges them, charges them about speaking false dreams. But my point was, Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is a very funny phrase. If you think about it, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You chuck the dirty water out, but you keep the baby. Amen. God speaks with this weightiness 
of his word upon it and he speaks in dreams and visions which are sometimes an actual visitation of the lord i've heard the lord speak from heaven into my life and i know that wasn't just a dream i've had all other dreams which i do confess they got muddied and muddled with and, and that's a place i need to cultivate uh, a habitation for dreams that are protected from the intrusions that come in. I revealed one a couple of years ago and it was intruded upon with other thoughts and that confused the plain sharing of a dream. You know, it wasn't a false dream, but it was intruded upon. So again, we need to grow, I need to grow. The pole point is to remind us of the reality of God being in this place with plenty to say. God is speaking. But if you do, don't cultivate uh, an appreciation of this weightiness of the Holy Spirit, his word in our mouth, his dreams and visions, and have a heart for that, you will miss and not carry what God is saying and doing. The challenge remains is what we carry truly from the Holy Spirit. Do we even have room in our thinking for such a truth as the Spirit of the Lord is upon me? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said to do this, to do that. And he went about healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And he knew God was with him, and he was being led, as we know. He did nothing except he heard and saw the Father do. He was hearing and seeing. He knew God's presence with him. And God had spoken from heaven an audible voice that the people heard. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And he is with us. And Jesus said they will make their home. The father and the son will make their home with us. So we can be sharpened up. We can be in the spirit more than we can be find ourselves. We can be under the anointing of God, under the, the Spirit of the Lord is resting well me. I know it. I know he's been speaking to me. I know God sort of shaped this word I'm bringing to you today. Are we speaking from our own hearts? Is our discernment actually suspicion gone bad? There is such a thing as a false burden, which is someone's own despair and depression, and out of that they speak. And the final conclusion point, the only way to be sure is to have our own integrity before God. I deal with God in the spirit and truth. I know when I'm offline. I know when I'm... I'm in error. I know when I've had intrusions into the dream language of God. I know when the Holy Spirit has backed away. I know when I've blatantly done wrong. I know because I'm in the Word of God that I know that I'm believing a lie about myself. And that can be a subtle thing. But I'm doing something about it. I'm dealing with God in a ruthless pursuit of God and his spotlight of truth. I love the wording of Job chapter 13. I tell you, there's some words there. He said, I will, and I've said, I will pursue the Lord until I know he is in this place. Job didn't say that, but that's my saying from Job. I will pursue the Lord until I know he is with me, until I know he's resting upon me here with me, the Father and the Son making their home. But Job's words, listen to these, Job 13, 3 and 4, but I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God. But you forgers of lies, you're all worthless physicians. 
I un uh, unpack that. He's saying, I will speak to God Almighty. I desire to reason things out with God. I'm not just accepting this by faith he's with me. I want to reason this out. I want a dialogue. I want a discussion. I want a relationship going on. But the phrase, you forgers of lies, you are worthless physicians. He's acknowledging, I would like a physician if you know Job's plight who would have liked some comfort from, from the spirit of the Lord himself speaking into his situation. And all they had, his friends, were forges of lies. God challenged them and rebuked their, their counsel at the end, which is, makes Job a strange book, because what they said sounded so right but God rebuked them and said, who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? And again, I'll say some other things from Job 13, lovely wording. Your platitudes are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are of clay. Wording there. And finally, one of the most famous and powerful statements, though he slay me, Job said, I will trust him, yet I will trust him. Even so, I defend my own way before him. What a stance before God. If he kills me, I still trust him, but I'm still going to have this dialogue. I'm still going to reason these things out with God because I want to know him. I want to know him and I want to know he is with us. The pursuit of God will reveal all and it will be the integrity of our hearts where we know the Lord is with us. I pray that you will make that your lifestyle. You want to know he is with us. And you are fighting off these lies about your true identity in every manner. The world has gone mad out there believing any old thing. But you will be different and contend and be like Job. Reason it out with God talk it through with God, everything. He knows it all. You won't shock him. Talk it through. Amen.